In our previous video, we learnt more about the construction of the Victoria Building. Once it had been completed, the College Council noted that the building had given the College more room for teaching and to allow lectures to start on time. The common rooms and reading rooms were excellent facilities and the theatre, seating around 450 to 500 people, had been used for student entertainments, public lectures and public meetings. The Council did report that the administrative offices should have been larger, but concluded that the Victoria Building was well adapted for its purpose, satisfactorily warmed and ventilated and it sufficed for all central needs. In his own section of the report, Principal Rendell stated, the completion of the Victoria Building had completely changed the working conditions of student life. But what did the students themselves think of their brand new building? We can find this out from several of the student magazines that were published in the early 1890s, as well as from staff and student accounts. In 1893, almost a year after the first opening, a humorous student article commented that the Jubilee clock tower wasn't straight and that the college could now boast of a leaning tower of Liverpool. They continued that the clock was always running slow and the porter was constantly having to adjust the time and yet it always gave the students amusement to watch the clock jumping in the grand entrance hall. In an article from 1892 called Suggestions for a College Song, some of the building's features have been put into another humorous song by one of the students themselves. The song states the following. There's our college, in form and design resembling a first-class hotel. The hall and the corridors shine in a manner that naught can excel. There's the tower of patent red brick, suggestive of waterworks strong. Its price in grey stone was too thick, but you need not put that in the song. It commemorates Jubilee Day. There's the clock electricity primes with its most unaccountable way of jumping five minutes sometimes. The song seems to poke a little bit of fun at some of the building's features, including the jumping clock and the strong waterworks. We do know that there were numerous problems with the waterworks from letters sent by Professor Rendell to the architect Alfred Waterhouse right up until at least 1895 when he sent his own illustrations on the service of pipes to the ladies' toilets that had been filling up too slowly. Even in 1900, a student letter stated that they were disgusted by the lavatory in the Victoria building and stated the following. I feel disgusted with the state of the lavatory in the Victoria building. It jars upon my moral nature to wash in water the colour and consistency of refectory coffee. I have taken samples of this fluid and have subjected them to several tests. Another portion I injected into a guinea pig and its claws were turned into nails. I look to you to see that my sensitive nature and skin shall suffer no more indignities. Another student concern raised in the college magazine also relates to the lack of maintenance, but this time in relation to the whole building. The student stated the following. We do not know who is responsible for the cleaning of the Victoria building. Perhaps this is an advantage. We might not otherwise feel at liberty to speak our minds on the subject as freely as we should desire. For if there is any subject in which we should wish to use strong language, it is the shameful way in which the beauties of a handsome building are allowed to be turned into eyesores by neglect. Dust, slime and cobwebs meet the eye on every side. The very library always seems to require unlimited applications of soap and water. The windows in every part of the college are so covered with dirt that they strike gloom into the heart of every student. The beautiful tiling, which is so fine a feature of the building, is always covered with slime, which comes off on one's fingers. The mosaic floors, instead of being resplendent with every colour of the rainbow, 
are all of one dull, monotonous grey. Who is to blame? We know not, but we trust his culpable neglect may bring him, if no other punishment, at least the flagellation of a guilty conscience. However, some of the student articles were a lot more serious in their tone. As one correspondent writing in October 1893 entitled their article, Wandering in Search of Warmth. Sir, one day last week I went from the dissecting room, where we were all blue and shivering, to the library, thinking it would be warmer and that I could do two or three hours work there. After sitting for a little more than an hour at a temperature of 38 degrees Fahrenheit, I was obliged to leave, colder than when I entered, though wearing a thick overcoat. I then went to the café, which was very little better, and it took several cups of scalding coffee to restore my circulation. Now, sir, I do not think it reasonable or justifiable that our college authorities should expect us to live and work under such conditions as they evidently do. The condition of the dissecting room is notoriously bad. That of the library, a much newer structure, is criminal, as the heating apparatus should have been so much more perfect. All last term it was kept at a temperature which was noticeably uncomfortable. I have spoken to many students of all sides and both sexes on the subject, and they are unanimous in their complaints of its coldness. Of course, as so little attention is paid to our comfort in places in which we work, the debility of the warming apparatus in the café is perfectly comprehensible. Yours, etc., El Peregrino. In 1894, a few months later, it appears that things hadn't changed as the temperature in the Tate Library was still an issue for one student who recalled the following account. Sir, I am one of those misguided mortals who thinks that they can work in the Tate Library. Do not condemn me at once. It is my misfortune, not my fault. Have you ever tried to work there? You go there shortly after ten in the morning. All is then peaceful and quiet, though the atmosphere is clammy and cold. A strong disposition to work comes upon you, and shivering slightly, you open your books. In a side alcove, reflecting that there are very many pipes which might, under circumstances over which students have limited control, contain hot water in a few minutes. It also appears that the library had many other issues for the students that have been a subject of contention in libraries all over the world, and that is the subject of peace and quiet when studying. The complainant to the Sphinx magazine describes what it was like to work in the room in 1894. Your work is disturbed by the sound of revelry. A group of merry yokels comes bounding along. You would gladly join in their frolics but for your work. They scamper hither and thither and rejoice to strike the adamant floor with their heavy boots. Their conversation is temporarily lowered by the rapid approach of an enemy from the end of the room. This danger past, other sounds, not far off, compel your attention. These are the laughter of some fair maidens who run up and down the library for exercise and sometimes gamble with playful delight. Your reading not having progressed satisfactorily, you return in the afternoon, hoping for better things. But while you read, you will continually be disturbed by animated conversations, by ceaseless tramplings up and down, which the hard floor accentuates. And in addition to these troubles, the lights become very dim. The electric light is turned on later, but gives a wretched illumination. These things, together with powerful draughts, and in the cold, conspire to render your attempts to work fruitless. Later on, when the merry yokels and playful damsels have gone home, if there were better light, 
Fewer drafts and less approach to the temperature of a cellar, one might be able to work. But at five o'clock... Please, sir, we're going to close the library now. Now, Mr Editor, I asked for your assistance in obtaining a remedy for these grievances, which I have only slightly exaggerated, from Imaginary Worker. Another student called Frustrated Reader responded to the article and added that the coldness and draftiness are in themselves suffice to deter all but the hardiest from attempting to work there, while the appearance of the room at 4pm is a direct negative to the college motto, Fiat Lux, or Let There Be Light. For a modern comparison, even in 2020, if the modern radiators are not all switched on, the Tate Hall Museum can still be a bit chilly in winter due to the very high ceilings and vast open spaces in the room. And although we have more chandeliers than in 1892, we do still have to keep our electric lighting levels low to preserve our artefacts. Thankfully, we do allow people to talk and have fun, but as a visitor services assistant, much like the so-called enemy described in the student magazine, I may have to rapidly approach anyone who decides to run or jump playfully near any of the display cases. More often than not, our modern day visitors marvel at the impressive ceiling in the Tate Hall Museum, and it does appear that visitors to the building in 1893 also felt the same, as they admired the library and bestowed a qualified approval on the Arts Lecture Theatre, which is also on the second floor. However, in contrast to our modern day visitors' praise of our Gothic building and its Victorian architecture, the visitors in 1893 also pointed out a few negative features, including that the entrance hall was an awfully funny looking place, and they commented disparagingly on the painfully new appearance of the main staircase. Another student article provides more detail on these negative feelings towards the new building, stating the following account. Having passed through the period when people imagined that the Victoria Building represented the highest achievement of the human brain in the art of architecture, we have now come to the reaction when everybody has some fault defined. The curious thing is that no two people agree in liking and disliking the same things. I find, however, that I'm pretty sure to meet with agreement if I condemn the mantelpiece of the Great Hall, the inscription on the front of the building, the pedestal of the bushel statue, the windows of the men's reading room, and the desks in the history classroom. On all these points, there is a remarkable consensus of opinion. In further correspondence, we've been able to piece together exactly what was wrong with some of these areas. It appears that the students themselves thought that there were far too many inscriptions and plaques around the building, and that the windows were always covered in dirt and grime. For the 2008 refurbishment of the Victoria Building, quite a lot of cleaning was done to the tile work, especially in the Grand Entrance Hall, as after many years of the large fireplace being lit, a lot of the tiles had darkened in colour. You can see this difference at the top of the balcony columns, which were not touched during the renovation. Industrial Victorian cities often had problems with soot darkening their buildings and covering them with grime, but Waterhouse had specifically chosen the red brick and terracotta, as he believed that it was more hygienic material to work with, offering more resistance to dirt, especially in highly polluted cities like Liverpool and London. The interiors, such as the faience and glazed tiles, also proved that it was easier to clean these parts of the building, although if we're to believe the student accounts, the cleaning was not up to standard. Window cleaning was no easy task in the 1890s, as this photograph shows, as there were not the same levels of health and safety in place. The council had reported that the reading rooms were excellent, however the female students commented in their section of the Sphinx magazine that the ladies reading room during the winter months was cold and dreary, but during the summer months it became bright and animated and was a favourite spot for the female students, so it appears that the whole building did have issues with heating. Although some furniture had been designed by Alfred Waterhouse and Principal Rendell for the student areas, the students considered their personal rooms looked a little bare and needed improving, and so the, both the male and the female student representative councils set about getting furniture and furnishings for their spaces. 
Students paid a fee of half a crown per year, or around £10 in today's money, to use the reading room, and it was hoped the fee would prevent rowdyism and destruction, and the funds could go towards buying things that were needed. There was also a furnishing fund, and one male student donated around £50, which was the equivalent of a day's wages for a skilled tradesman at the time. We know that in 1888, £200 had been raised by the women's students, which would be thousands of pounds today. During the autumn term of 1893, the female students' common room was furnished with three easy chairs, a rug, two palms, a tea service, embroidered Japanese screens, flower stands with freshly cut flowers, and a portrait of the novelist and poet George Meredith by G.F. Watts. A beautiful large mirror and much-needed notice boards were later additions. By January 1895, they'd raised a further £4,500 that had paid the bills for recent furnishing and left them with £100 to spend for future purchases. The Female Student Council noted that there was still much yet to be done. In time, the walls would be papered, new chairs would be provided and would be more in harmony with the rest of the room than what the college had originally supplied. There was also some hope for tablecloths to add colour and more pictures and things necessary to get to the ideal standard. Coming generations of students would each leave their mark of gratitude and affection in the added beauty of these rooms which past generations had worked so hopefully and wanted for so long. In 1904 a female student appealed to the representative council due to the state of the women's rooms. The floor was rarely cleaned, there was smoke in the fireplace due to the chimney not being swept, and the beautiful carving on the mantelpiece could not be seen due to soot covering it. In 1913, a poem written by one of the female students gives us an idea of what life was like in the Victoria building, and how an uplifting cup of tea by the fireplace in the women's common room could be. I'll leave the Tate and go downstairs. No more old musty books for me. A reckless damsel, she who dares, two biscuits and a cup of tea. She treads the cold and stony floors, knowing that for a penny she can get within these sacred doors, two biscuits and a cup of tea. She finds her friends around the fire, with sauces balanced on their knee. She joins the group and soon has by her two biscuits and a cup of tea. A little gossip makes time fly. Oh, tis a merry group to see. Then all depart, made cheerful by two biscuits and a cup of tea. The male students also appeal to their members to send in pictures or further donations to liven up the walls of their personal space. However, one student noted that although the student council was aiming to soften and adorn the reading room, they wished that certain periodicals, like the sketch and pick-me-up, were gotten rid of, as they mocked the inscription on the college walls, hindered learning and abused leisure time. They suggested that busts of Pliny the Elder, whose diligence knew no leisure, might be more appropriate for the reading room adornments in a college. Unfortunately, the male students were not quite as elaborate with their descriptions of the reading and common room, and we do not have a very clear picture of what they were able to achieve. In fact, the female students note in the college magazine that they'd been told to edit down their news as they took up far too much space. They could not fully detail all the furnishing work that had been done in their own rooms, but it is thanks to these accounts that we can picture how the building would have looked in the early days of the college. Other areas of the building, such as the Arts Lecture Theatre, were also noted in the student magazine and seem a lot more positive than other areas of the building. The sixth annual student soiree was held in the Victoria building and 900 people were present. The article states that the Victoria building is particularly well fitted for such functions and looked at its best, that the spectacle of the Arts Theatre when it's lit up and filled with people and evening dress was so fine that you could excuse inattention to the music being performed. In another article from 1907, a student praised the space for being the only lecture theatre in the university that could provide comfort and space for those in academic dress, attending the Guild lectures. In stark contrast, however, it was also used for smoking concerts, and one student complained in the student magazine, stating the following account. 
There is nothing more disagreeable than being compelled to swallow second-hand tobacco smoke. There is little enjoyment in listening to good music when the senses of vision, taste and smell are alike being offended. Apart from all that, there is one consideration which is in my mind alone sufficient reason for not relaxing the stringency of rules against smoking, and that is the danger of having our fine new building destroyed by a fire caused by a fire caused by a careless and selfish smoker. In 1917, a student gave a humorous account of examinations taking place within the arts theatre that Principal Rendell had helped design, especially for examinations with removable tears. The student provided the following account. I stumble up to a narrow platform by way of narrower steps constructed ages ago by men of the narrowest minds. I collapse into a chair and in doing so, force two of the four legs inwardly. The law of gravity asserts itself. I hiss something unpoetical. By a glorious effort, I save the piece of furniture from precipitation after scattering pens and paper earthwards to the extent of two or three platforms deep. <laughs> a sound of tumbling or stumbling down those narrow stairs attracts my attention. It is merely an insignificant wretch doing the goose step to obtain more paper. In fact, even today, these steps in the lecture theatre take a bit of getting used to, and we often advise our brides-to-be to bring their wedding shoes and practice their entrance down these stairs towards the aisle. In comparison to Principal Rendell's report in 1887 about the converted asylum building, whereby every fragment of space was pressured into service, with no private rooms for staff or students and no provision for large lectures over 150 people, it is clear that the new purpose-built Victoria building offered a lot more space for both the staff and students at the college. Professor Strong, who wrote the original college song for the opening of the Victoria Building and also taught Latin, recounted his early days working in the asylum building compared to the newly built Victoria Building in the student magazine printed in 1907. He stated the following account. My classroom was very comfortable and was warmed by an open grate which gave off no pestilential fumes such as those to which we are getting acclimatized in the Victoria buildings, in which, I should think, even Basili can hardly exist. <laughs> These later accounts in 1907, 15 years after the building was constructed, show how fashions and attitudes had already changed in relation to architectural designs. The Freshers stated that the red brick work of the Victoria building did not impress them favourably and the whole building struck them as a somewhat unworthy home for the most cultured enterprises of a dignified city. Its architectural design seemed nondescript, its fabric regrettable and the total effect lacking dignity. The inside also disappointed this fresher, as they had expected something finer for the entrance hall and thought the tiles and colour to be incredibly ugly. In fact, even Professor Charles Riley, the Professor of Architecture from 1904 to 1933, hated Waterhouse's Victorian Gothic designs and described it as mud and blood architecture. In a 1909 student article, the glazed brick interiors are compared to a station subway with an unsightly tower. And in 1913, a German visitor mistook the quadrangle and surrounding buildings as factories for the working class, much to the horror of the student showing him around. However, in 1914, a poem called My College by a member of the alumni shows that nostalgia might have helped some of the students to look upon their building in a more favourable light. My College. Oh, what memories it brings of joys and sorrows in the days gone by when time flew swiftly by on eagle wings, time with the halo that it ever flings round past and future to my inward eye. Classroom and common room, they all are nigh. The stately house of God, our joy and pride, that spreads its healing wings both far and wide. The aged minster with its creaking bell, the roaring mersey that we loved so well. What visions sweet these haunts inspire, 
unsung by bard, untouched by lyre. Where are my old companions? Where are they? Like leaves of autumn, scattered far and wide. It is apparent that many of these student and staff accounts from the college magazine were written tongue-in-cheek and merge humour alongside the real concerns with the building. Thankfully our building is now a lot warmer, cleaner and brighter than it was in its early days. We no longer have soot from the large fireplaces covering the building with dirt and the addition of modern electric lighting and additional heating has helped provide a much more inviting atmosphere. Several spaces in the building are still used by our students today, including the lecture theatre and cafe area, especially in 2020, when more socially distant study spaces were required during the pandemic. And it's been lovely to welcome them back to the original building and have them studying in these spaces once again. Ultimately, architectural styles change with the times and things come in and out of fashion. Today, our building attracts a lot of positive comments. But what do you think of the Victoria building? We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching.